Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. A house fire on San Antonio's north side turns deadly. One person killed, another hurt. Katrina Weber at the scene with what San Antonio fire officials say happened. And new developments in the hostage situation at a Texas synagogue. David Sears has details about two people arrested in connection to the incident. That's in your morning headlines. A local museum collecting photos and documents of past MLK marches. Coming up, Tiffany Huertas has details on the project and how you can get involved. And good morning to you. It is MLK Day Monday, January 17th. I hope everyone who has the day off the federal holidays, enjoying their time, doing some service, whatever you can do. I know our MLK annual march canceled again, gone virtually because of the pandemic. But I know we're going to have a live report from Max Massey there. They are basically turned Sullivan Park into a COVID-19 testing and vaccine. That's drive. all true. Yep, we'll talk to him coming up. Let's go outside with live cam. It was another cold start to today. And as we bring in Justin Horn, I'm hearing rumbling is about some good news in the allergen department. Uh, it looks so much better than it did on Saturday. We can say that for sure. Saturday was awful. Those winds, Mountain Cedar jumped way up. We'll show you that in just a sec. First, let's start with the temperatures. Got down close to freezing here in San Antonio this morning. Many of the outlying areas did. We're at 44 right now, so we've jumped up nicely. With this dry air, you're going to see some big swings in temperature. We know that uh, we should be back in the 70s this afternoon, but there still are a few spots reporting below freezing temperatures, including up around Comfort, Kerrville, and Bandera at this hour. As Mark alluded to, much better looking pollen count. Yes, Mountain Cedar is moderate, but it's so, so much better than it was on Saturday and even yesterday for that matter. Molds are low at 180. Here's what to expect. You see those clear skies here in the background. Sunny and beautiful today. Tuesday and Wednesday will be warm. We could be close to 80 by Wednesday. Slightly more humidity, although you probably won't notice it all that much. And then by Wednesday night, a strong cold front moves in. This brings some big changes, especially on Thursday. In the meantime, Martin Luther King Jr. Day looks beautiful. We'll be up around 70 this afternoon. Sunny skies and uh, some light winds, guys. Thank you, Justin. Let's take a look at it. Trans guy traffic looks like it's flowing pretty smooth out this morning. Justin filled in this morning. Didn't have really much on traffic incidents. If you're out on this MLK day, please be safe. Looks like we have a stalled vehicle on that right shoulder in that last trans guide shot. Here's today's nine at nine. Health experts say we haven't hit the peak of Omicron cases in the U.S. and should be prepared for cases to continue to climb. The U.S. is averaging 780,000 daily cases. Starting Wednesday, families can request free at-home rapid tests from a new government website being launched by the Biden administration. On the East Coast, a furious winter storm is packing heavy winds, ice and snow, leaving nearly 250,000 homes and businesses without power overnight. Meanwhile, more than 1,000 flights have been canceled this morning as the storm moves into the northeastern U.S. New concerns this morning for the remote island of Tonga. Officials say the communications cable underwater may have been destroyed in this weekend's underwater volcanic blast, making it difficult to communicate to the island. A second blast was reported Sunday. Tsunami warnings were in effect for the western U.S. all weekend. Officials in South America say people were killed by the waves. As the debate over voting rights continues in Washington, millions are planning celebrations in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Stock markets, government offices, and banks are closed in honor of the holiday. After a last-minute decision, Novak Djokovic will not be defending his men's Australian Open title tonight. Federal court judges in Australia decided to cancel Djokovic's visa for not being vaccinated against COVID-19. Djokovic is traveling back to Serbia today. After months of back and forth, Verizon and AT&T have the green light to install 5G towers near airports. The FAA and airlines feared the technology would interfere with aircraft instruments. The FAA now cleared the 5G installations, which will begin this week. It could cost you more to stream your favorite shows on Netflix. The company is increasing its monthly subscription plans from $13.99 to $15.49. The LA Rams and Arizona Cardinals will make history when they take the field tonight for their wild card matchup. The game between the two NFC West foes will be the first ever playoff game on a Monday night. Kickoff is set for 7:15. Betty White would have turned 100 years old today. While her funeral arrangements remain private, fans will still have the opportunity to mourn her at home or in theaters with a special documentary 
about the Emmy-winning actress. The film will air in theaters nationwide today only. You can also donate to your favorite charity in honor of Betty White. And that's today's 9 at 9. We touched on it briefly in the 9 at 9. Just a reminder, today is a federal holiday. A number of places around town are closed in observance of Martin Luther King Day. City Hall and most other municipal offices are not going to be open. Alba Dome offices, box offices closed, as well as central libraries and all the branches. Uh, no postal service today. Most banks are closed for the full list of MLK Day closures. Go to our website at ksat.com. Well, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that, and hate can't drive out hate. Only love can do that. It is so important to remember and honor the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., not just today, but every day. The annual MLK March here in San Antonio, the largest across the country. This year it's virtual because of the pandemic, but there are still some events going on. Max Massey joins us live at Pittman Sullivan Park. Max, what's happening over there? Good morning, guys. There's a lot going on here already. You see there's a line. These are people getting vaccinated. So here at Pittman Sullivan Park, there's vaccinations, there's testing, there's even a blood drive. Joined here with Renee Watson, the chair of the MLK Commission. So good morning, Renee. Why is today so important to gather the community and have all these things here at the park? Good morning. As you know, we canceled the MLK March. But at the same time, this is usually where it stops. There's always a celebration in this park. Today, we are celebrating life by bringing out the blood drive because our, our, our blood bank needs desperately from our community. And we want to make sure people are tested so they can not only go back to work or maybe they can stay at work and then get their vaccines and their boosters because the Omicron var variant is just spreading so fast. That's why everything is so important today. And this is the second year in a row that it has gone virtual. You were also the chair last year. So what does this decision process look like and why are you still so confident about the virtual march? So we track the numbers. We, we were tracking last year when the Omicron was not around, but the Delta and the regular COVID-19. And now with Omicron, it's spreading so fast. There's so many in our communities that are impacted. Up until three weeks ago, we were going to have an in-person march. But we were tracking the numbers, talking to Metro Health. We were looking at what the mayor and the county, the county commissioners and the judge were saying about Fort Sam Houston, requesting more nurses from the National Guard, from the governor. All of that made us speak about and really talk about what does this mean for our community if we brought out 100,000 people. We know that the fire department, the central and police department, all of the frontline workers, the bus drivers, are having a hard time filling those spaces because they're sick. So it would have been irresponsible for us to be able to say, let's do it anyway. That is not what the values of Dr. King. Dr. King was about making sure his community was safe and protected. And that's what we're doing today. And speaking of the values of Dr. King, what does he mean to you? What does he mean to this community? Well, I was one of the fortunate individuals who, is, who marched with Reverend Callis 50, over 50 years ago. And being a part of all of that, all the way up to getting the holiday when Governor Richards was in office. Texas was the second state to the last to say yes after uh, we wanted to do the holiday for Dr. King. I was actually a state employee and we used to have to choose between three days that would be equivalent. Columbus Day, Confederates Day, or Martin Luther King holiday. So in 91, when the Governor Richard signed that bill and said, we will be like every other except Arizona at the time, because they were the last to come on board for the holiday. So it's very, very inspirational and emotional for me and for us to say we cannot march because we march for the issues. Some of us know why we are marching. Some of us just want to get out there. Those of us who march for the issues know the issue today is voting rights. John Lewis almost lost his life at Bloody Sunday. And now we're still trying to get the John Lewis Act for voting rights passed in the U.S. Senate. All right, Renee Watson, thank you so much. And guys, we are far from done. We do expect that press conference coming up right behind us, 9.30 a.m. So we'll check back in with you guys in a bit. Back to you. Thank you, Max. Arson investigators working to find the cause of a fire that killed one person and sent another to the hospital. Firefighters found both of those victims inside their burning home in the 100 block of Brightwood Place. That's near Broadway and Bassey Road. Our Katrina Weber has that story from the scene and says the fire also threatened neighbors' homes. One neighbor told me off camera that she believes there could have been more injuries or even deaths had it not been for a couple of newspaper delivery people. She says they were driving by, noticed the fire, and then began banging on people's doors. When firefighters arrived after 4.30 this morning, some of those neighbors were out of their homes while flames shot out of another house in the 100 block of Brightwood Place. 
The concern, though, was for the couple who lived there, a man and woman in their late 60s. Within minutes, firefighters had located the husband, who had suffered injuries, possibly burns. He was rushed to a hospital. They later pulled his wife from the home, but they were not able to save her. Firefighters say the couple's three dogs also died. The fire, meanwhile, wouldn't die. For nearly an hour, it put up a stubborn fight. Firefighters called in an arson team to investigate, but so far there's no word on what caused the fire. At one point, firefighters thought they may have had a third victim, a relative who usually visits with this couple, but they say they found out that person wasn't here after all. Reporting from the north side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. In your morning headlines, the latest on that synagogue hostage situation. A look at the destruction left behind from a weekend tornado in Florida. A hunter decides not to shoot. David Sears is here on a Monday. Good morning, David. Morning. Yeah, I got decided there wasn't a sport in it with these two deer, and we'll show you why. What happened to these two deer in just a second, but first let's start with this. We're going to start by getting you caught up on the latest from the hostage situation in Colleyville up near Dallas. The hostages are free. The hostage taker is dead, and there are two teenagers in England being held for questioning. The situation started Saturday when the suspect crashed to service at the congregation Beth Israel and ended up taking four hostages, including a rabbi. The suspect, a British national, 44-year-old Malik Fazel Akram, when he first went into the synagogue, he could be heard on the live stream. They eventually shut that down. The suspect had a gun and claimed to have a bomb in his backpack. He demanded the release of a convicted terrorist known as Lady Al-Qaeda. Anytime you have an, an Islamic type extremist or someone who sort of purports to be that supposedly, that they can end really badly, as we well know. That standoff lasted 11 hours. The hostages escaped through a side door, all of them uninjured. The suspect shot dead. There was a gun found, but no bomb. The rabbi credited the training members had received at the synagogue for a situation just like the one that occurred. The suspect's brother says he suffered from mental illness. He actually entered the U.S. back in December, flying from London to New York. Authorities don't know when he arrived in Texas, and they are looking to see if his mental health should have been something revealed in the vetting process. All right, let's take you to coastal Massachusetts. That is an oceanfront hotel, and that thing is burning to the ground. You can see pretty stiff winds blowing, which makes it much harder to fight the fire, especially when it's spread to other buildings. Several crews from different state agencies were sent to fight the flames. No word on what caused that fire. You are getting a bird's eye view of the damage left behind after an EF2 tornado ripped through Florida over the weekend. The National Weather Service says winds were as high as 118 miles an hour. Thousands are homeless and even more without power. 30 homes in Lee County completely wiped out. Another 108 were damaged. This terrible, fierce storm came through here. Uh, and I got trapped and it, 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 they, it lifted me off my feet and blew me, I thought, towards the, the, uh, the east wall, I believe it would have been. Fortunately, only three residents were injured by, those in, by, by the tornado and they were not life threatening. And finally this morning, we are finding out not always about the kill when you go hunting. We are in Wisconsin, and those are two bucks that are tangled up by the horns. Everett Sluga happened to be driving by and saw the two white tails rack to rack. He let the landowners know. And even though it is still hunting season up there in Wisconsin, Troy Rabercheck decided he would forgo the hunt and just try and save the two deer. So he grabbed the only tool he had, a grinder. I just didn't feel it was right shooting them in the situation they were in. Uh, it just didn't feel ethical to me, and, and I actually had my bow on them, and I pulled back on them, and, and I, I looked at Tammy, I said, I can't shoot these deer. And this guy allowed them to uh, enjoy a little bit of life uh, and participate, um, you know, in an ethic and a responsible way as a hunter. So I, I'm happy that he did this. Um, it's, it's a good story and good to see and hear. Yeah, you can see that's that's the grinder sitting there with the horns that he cut off the, the deer so they could get loose. There they go. The hunters do have some new fans now. The video of them setting the bucks free viewed 20 million times. There's the, there's, there's the grinder. You, you, you do what you got to do, right? That's you, all he had. So. Yeah, they were able to, to walk away. I've, I've seen videos of this before where, I mean, they're just plain worn out. And usually it takes mm -hmm. a little while for 
for at least one of the bucks to recover, but eventually they usually do walk away. And the uh, horns, the tips are, are pretty sharp, so you gotta yeah. be very careful. Would have been scared trying to so, hawk yeah, those hawks. So, yeah. Good for him. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. Right now, 913, about 44 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. RJ Marquez has a look at what's trending on KSAT.com this morning, including this story about one of the nation's most decorated and accomplished airmen. Welcome back. It was chilly this morning. We had temperatures drop down to freezing here in San Antonio officially. It does look like we dropped down to 32. That's a new updated number. 30 at Randolph, 32. New Braunfels, 28. Burning Stage, 25. And Kerrville. It was a chilly morning. Uh, very cold as you get up into the hill country. 31 in Del Rio, another spot, and Carissa Springs as well. It did drop down to freezing this morning along with Fredericksburg. So it was pretty widespread. Now the sun is up, though. Temperatures are on their way up. We're in the mid-40s now. And uh, you see the blue skies here in town. 44 degrees officially northwesterly winds at about 5. Dew point is at 21. So the air again bone dry right now. 40 Cane Lake, 43 New Braunfels, 32 Kerrville, 34 in Bandera. So we're still at freezing, but that number will jump up above freezing there in Kerrville very soon. Uh, 43 Creosote Springs, 39 currently in Gonzales. Dew point forecast over the next 30 hours. Very, very dry today, which is why I expect temperatures to really jump up this afternoon. We do start to see a little bit of an increase in moisture by tomorrow and even more so on Wednesday. Still, I don't think it's going to be to the point where you think it's humid out there, but uh, it, it will increase. Forecast for today, up near 70. We'll see sunny skies, a beautiful Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And as we look at the current snow depth across the country, storm system that brought us our front worked, uh, worked across the Midwest and then now is working its way up the East Coast. You can see where all the snow is. There was quite a bit of it. This was a big snowmaker for uh, even places like Mississippi where they picked up some snow. Now, as it moves up the East Coast, especially inland, there is uh, quite a bit of snow. And as we look at the radar and satellite, you can see where that storm system is now. So snow still flying across parts of Pennsylvania, upstate New York. And then as you get up into New Hampshire and Maine, some pretty heavy snow. And then it's rain along the coast. New York and Boston just dealing with a cold rain. So as we look back at Texas, you'll notice things are very quiet for now. That does start to change a little bit. So let's walk you through the forecast here. As we get into this afternoon, sunny skies, I think, and maybe a few high clouds working in tomorrow. No big deal. A little warmer on your Tuesday. By the time we get into Wednesday, here comes our next front. Right now, I think it's scheduled for Wednesday evening. As it moves through, we'll see some very gusty winds. We're not looking for rain with the front, at least not initially, but behind it, some energy moves in, and this is Thursday morning. You'll notice that this model does uh, bring in a little bit of wintry precip. Is it possible? Sure. Is it going to be heavy? No. And do I think it has, uh, it'll have big impacts? Probably not. But something to watch, mainly up there across the hill country. And then during the day on Thursday, just a, a chilly, light showery activity for us here in San Antonio, if that. I, again, I, it's not going to amount to much. It'll all be very, very light. But there are some chances of precipitation in the forecast on Thursday. So here's how it looks in the seven day forecast. We go 73 tomorrow, 79 Wednesday. It'll be a hot day until that front comes through and then abruptly changing. Breezy down to 36 Thursday morning. We are going to put in a slight chance for a mix across the hill country and then a 30% chance of some light showers on Thursday. I don't think uh, we'll get out of the 30s, or at least it'll be tough for us to do that. And then some temperatures near freezing Friday and Saturday morning. Another chance of rain down the line next week, guys. Thank you, Justin. Well, with San Antonio's MLK March canceled due to COVID-19 concerns, there are still ways you can get involved. The San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum is collecting documents and photos from 54 years of marches to make sure the history is available to not only future generations, but people around the world. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the museum on South Presa Street with more on this new project. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning. This nonprofit museum is also collecting newspaper clippings, flyers, t-shirts, videos, anything you can find of previous MLK marches. And to talk a little bit more about this, we have Deborah Jarman, the CEO and director here at the museum. Good morning. Good morning, Tiffany. How are you this morning? Good. Happy King Day. Yes, <laughs> happy King Day. Talk to us. You've been to the San Antonio March for about eight years. Correct. How is that experience for people that have never gone? Well, first of all, put it on your calendar to go next year <laughs> because the experience is indescribable. To be with so many people, 
recognizing why we're marching to begin with. And I think that's the key, recognizing the, the plight of poor people, the plight of our nation with civil rights, and even recognizing that things really haven't changed that much. In some ways they've changed a lot, but in some ways not much. There are unions and just corporations. The energy is infectious. Yes, I've covered that event before, and it is people from all walks of life coming together for this celebration. Um, yes. Talk to us about this project, and for people that want to get involved, talk to us a little bit more about it. Well, we are so excited. The march actually started with Reverend Ar uh, Arlington Callies um, right after the death of Dr. King. And so from that point on to now, there's just been a lot of coverage, be it photos, um, articles, t-shirts, any type, the programs, oh my gosh, I don't know if you are able to show the picture of the first program when it became a city event 35 years ago. So we want to collect that history because who would have thought San Antonio <laughs> would have the largest march in the nation. Incredible. The nation needs to know that. So we're going to get all these images, all the t-shirts, we're going to take pictures of them, and then what's going to happen to this? And so then they will go into a collection called the City of San Antonio MLK Collection. They will be uploaded to the Special Collections Digital Library at the Texas A&M San Antonio. So everyone would have access to be able to see uh, available for research and things like that. And that's the goal, to have all of this showcased all across the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And the thing about it is, is San Antonio's history, black history, it is a part of American history. But if you don't know it, it's just a story that someone may have told you. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. We'll You're have welcome, a little bit. Tiffany. <laughs> we'll have a little bit more about this coming up in the noon show. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you, Tiffany. Right now, 9:23 and an MLK day, 45 degrees. Still head on GMSA at nine. Hispanic Elvis in the hospital this morning. An update on his condition and what his family says happened. A beloved street performer here in San Antonio known as Hispanic Elvis is in the hospital and many people have been sharing their prayers for the artist over social media. Our RJ Marquez spoke to his family about the impact he's had on the community. He's gifted that, you know, a lot of people know him. For more than 20 years, the popular performer known as Hispanic Elvis has entertained countless San Antonio residents and visitors, usually in front of Meet the Etta restaurant at Market Square. Seen carrying his homemade guitar and wearing flashy clothes, his brother, George Cisnero, says Hispanic Elvis loved being around people. They recognize him wherever they, they, they see him. To me, he's a pretty lucky man, you know? Hispanic Elvis was born and raised on the West Side. He started playing music early in his life at local venues in the 1960s and 70s. He would get his guitar and go down to the malt house, uh, Paul Barine or um, the a and Root Beer and go play his guitar for some of the waitresses there. He was a talented musician and also wrote songs. Couldn't read music and all that, but he would hear the song and he'd play, play, try it until he got it right. And he later took on the Hispanic Elvis persona and became a beloved San Antonio personality. Cisnero said the outpouring of support for his brother after he went to the hospital has been unbelievable. There's a lot of people out there, good people here in San Antonio that, that, that really love him, you know, and like him a lot. I think he really kind of misses just being out here and being around. I have no doubt. I'm pretty sure. If he could stand up and talk, he'd probably be performing there for the nurses, you know? <laughs> RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Of course, there is much more ahead on GMSA at 9. Hey, speaking of RJ, he joins us live for a look at what's up on KSAT.com this morning. And later, RJ and David have a look at this weekend's sports headlines and uh, the discussions in the newsroom about what happened to the Cowboys uh. have been interesting. Let's just say that. <laughs> Well, this morning on KSAT.com, an American war hero passes away after recently being honored here in San Antonio. And big moves for Bucky's, but some feelings are hurt. That's right. And a great deal at San Antonio Zoo to honor the iconic 
actress Betty White. RJ Marquez is in the studio with some of the top stories trending on KSAT.com. Hey there. Yeah, good hey. Monday morning, guys. Of course, Betty White would have been 100 years old today. today. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of ways that people are honoring the zoo. Just one of many. So it's a pretty cool deal that they have going on. But uh, first of all, we start here with this story. Uh, tributes coming in this morning for decorated Tuskegee Airman Brigadier General Charles E. McGee, who has died at 102 years old. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III posted about McGee's death on social media on Sunday, saying in part, we lost an American hero. He wrote, while I am saddened by his loss, I'm also incredibly grateful for his sacrifice, his legacy, and his character. Definitely great words there. McGee was honored last month on his 102nd birthday right here in San Antonio by the 99th Flying Squadron, Training Squadron. One of the T-1A Jayhawks, also uh, used by the squadron, was named in McGee's honor. So McGee, McGee graduated from flight training in 1943, becoming one of the U.S. Army's famed Tuskegee Airmen, the first black military aviators in the U.S. Service Corps. Over the course of his historic career, McGee successfully completed 409 air combat missions across three wars, serving a total of 30 years of active service. When I heard career. that he had passed, I thought, is this the gentleman that was just here? And yeah. it turns out he was. Yeah, and apparently there's still two more Tuskegee Airmen that live in the San Antonio area. Okay. I believe 103 and 99 years okay. old. Okay, Katrina so. Weber brought that up in yes. the newsroom this morning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, obviously an honored, uh, an honored squadron there, and so our respect to Mr. McGee there and his family. And his family, of yes. course. All right, guys, switching gears a little bit here. Well, they say everything is bigger and better in Texas. But that will soon not be the case for Bucky's. A new Bucky's is set to open later this year in Tennessee. And get this, I cannot believe it. It will be bigger than the one up the road in New Braunfels. How dare they do this to How us? How dare they? <laughs> Who do they think they are? <laughs> yes, right now, the New Braunfels Bucky's is considered to be the world's largest convenience store at more than 66,300 square feet. But this one in Tennessee will be more than 74,000 square feet on 200 acres. So in response to this news, the city of New Braunfels had a funny post on TikTok and Facebook, along with a Taylor Swift song and the hashtags, please don't be in love with someone else, and hashtag don't leave me. <laughs> They're having not fun familiar. with it. It's like, pick me, <laughs> yes. choose me. <laughs> not on, too Bucky. familiar with the Taylor Swift uh, song list, but I'm guessing that's uh, that has to do with Taylor Swift. <laughs> Let, so we'll seed we'll this to Tennessee for now, but I imagine it won't last no, long. No, I mean, yeah. they're, they're a Texas-based company. So they, I bet yes. they have to have plans. And yes. there's more locations right? to come. We know that we for sure. We got one. Yeah, it's yeah. coding one out in a burning, burning right? area. They're That's right. Go. Yeah, so we'll see here. Tennessee's got us for now. All right, guys, so today would have been Betty White's 100th birthday, and the San Antonio Zoo wants to honor and celebrate the life of the Golden Girl with a golden deal. The San Antonio Zoo is hosting a thank you for being a friend day, love that, to honor White's legacy of work in animal welfare, conservation efforts, and zoo advocacy. Standard admission to the zoo will be $8 today and zoo members can, well, there you guessed it, bring a friend free of charge. And people 65 years or older will also receive free admission to the zoo today. All discounts are available at the zoo front gate and cannot be purchased online. So interesting to note that the zoo is open until 5 p.m. today. So a lot of different things, including the, uh, the Betty White Challenge, right? Which was to donate $5 to a humane shelter and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So yeah, a lot of people still honoring Betty White today. It's a great deal for the zoo. Mm -hmm. It is, definitely. Also, fun going to the zoo on a holiday. Love it. Yes, I, I good times. I went over New Year's. It was so much fun. <laughs> yes, it would be a great day to go out there. All right, we're going to talk sports with you oh, and David man, coming up in thoughts. just a second. I see David just brewing over there. Yeah. <laughs> they are brewing. ready to go. I see the smoke coming they out. They are locked and loaded. I think if, if one or both of them would probably Ooh. fire Mike McCarthy today if given a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, that's just me. Anyway, outside with live camp, and it's, uh, it's 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 getting warmer, Justin. It is uh, pretty and sun, quickly. And the sun is out. And not because David Sears is you know in here <laughs> brewing over there. Uh, can't wait for that analysis. By the it's way, it's overcast over there. <laughs> sunny over here. Uh, it is going to be beautiful today. We're seeing temperatures warm up to 44 degrees here in San Antonio. The 39 Boulevard, 36 Comfort, 34 in Kerrville. After starting off near freezing uh, across San Antonio this morning. As we zoom out, summits 41 in Del Rio, 45 currently in Carrizo Springs, and there's the scene outside. Doesn't get much better than that. It really is a gorgeous morning. Dew point is at 21, so the air is still very, very dry, and those dew points actually fall off a little bit this afternoon. Northwesterly winds at around 5. Take a look at the temperatures over the next seven days. Bottom falls out Wednesday night into Thursday. We get a cold front, and at this point, with cloud cover around on Thursday, I think it's going to be a chilly day. Most of us 
right around 40 degrees or so with gusty winds. There's also the possibility of a little bit of precipitation, and we'll talk more about that coming up in the forecast here in just a few minutes. In the meantime, beautiful weather today as we talked about. 62 noontime, 70 this afternoon with uh, clear skies and light winds. Guys. 937. You're watching GMSA at 9. Like we just said, David and RJ's, they're coming up next with our weekend sports highlights. Get, get your popcorn ready. Yeah. <laughs> Cowboys fans were still dealing with it this morning after that tough loss to the San Francisco 49ers. I, I really can't make eye contact with people at this point about this. David and <laughs> RJ have to talk about, talk about this, right this now. one. Where to begin, gentlemen? Man, man. Where do you want to begin, David? Look at the bright side. Down here. We what's can, the, we can, what's we can, the bright side? Our, I don't know. We can say our glass is half full. They had a great season. You ate oh, good Cowboys. No. And then we can say, what the <laughs> heck was that yesterday? Yeah. Unprepared. Yeah. That's what that was. I thought Dan Quinn was supposed to be some de defensive genius. Does that look like a defensive genius to And you? he was going up against his former yeah. offensive coordinator in Kyle Shanahan. So you kind of knew that they already knew each other a little bit from back in their days. In, I think in Kyle Atlanta. got the best of that. I'm going to. Uh, okay. <laughs> Bosa, <laughs> their best off. defensive player. Mm-hmm. He got hurt in the first half. If he doesn't get hurt, for Parsons got hurt, yeah. but he came back in. But both of their best defensive player got hurt. He didn't come back. And if he <laughs> would have stayed in the game, Dak would have got sacked like nine times. Yeah, so it felt like the Cowboys so. finally woke up here. Second quarter oh, down 13-0. They, they did yeah, a little okay. bit. Yes, That's they nice did. Pass. Really Look at Dak throw a nice pass. <laughs> one but, of about uh, 50. Yeah. Yeah, well, here was the one, one that uh, one. it was not the good one, uh, David, no. right there. That interception, uh, which really okay. kind of put the Cowboys definitely on the ropes here early in the uh, second half here. Debo Samuel with a nice touchdown run Ooh. for the Niners. That guy's a wide receiver, and he's doing that to him as, as a running back. Mm -hmm. And that guy, we're, we're still not sure about that guy. <laughs> And look at this. That, now that's I'm how you throw sure a pass. Dak. Maybe yeah. Dak was watching that. Maybe Dak was watching the punter throw a pass and complete it, and then they got to settle for a field goal. Yeah, Cowboys did. Goal. Okay, so, so right. Cowboys here down 23-10. They did manage to uh, to get back in this game here. It was 23-10 interception right there by Anthony Brown. So Dak did score a touchdown here to get them. But, uh, of course, what everyone talking about this morning, David, is this final uh, sequence of plays here as Dak uh, struggled for the most part, but got him. Okay, he got, got the touchdown. Mm -hmm. But then this is. Uh, this 49ers. was the, the 49ers almost getting the first down okay, here. Okay, they didn't the game get the first down. Look, did not. So here we yeah. go. Final drive. Final drive. So Dak's got him going down the field. <laughs> and here he goes. Mm -hmm. Look at this pass. That was it. This was a nifty like play. A little to get down play the right there. Yeah. Hey, you yeah. like that? A little lateral? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Get out of bounds. They ran four plays. They got out of bounds on all four plays. Clock's running out. See, here's another one. Out of bounds. Okay, so we're at the Clock 41. Stops. So we're at the 41. seconds left. And here's another one. Well, here's the this draw. One, Dak this decides one. he's going <laughs> to do this. Okay, so now he's got to get up. they got to get the ball set so they can spike it and clock it, right? So they can stop the clock. Uh, no, time ran out. <laughs> <laughs> Time right out. Uh, exactly. No. So, are you? How many people in this city and in this country were Cowboy fans that just flew right off the couch right about then? Just went, what in the world are they doing? Here's the thing. It's a super risky play because you have 14 <sighs> seconds left. You know the clock is going to continue to run. Tony okay. Romo calling the game okay. actually okay. said it during the play that they have to let the umpire touch the ball before they snap the ball. So to, Romo kind of knew what was going on there. Dak just okay. gave it back to the center. So explain that. So when Dak runs the ball, Dak decides he's going to run it. Which it was wide open, and that's fine. There was, what, what 14 seconds left? About, uh, yes. Yeah, and he, and he's, got, he's got time to get down, slide, get back to the line of scrimmage, he thinks, and spike the ball. And that, then it's I he's got given the first down, play. and then they got one play, and they wanted to get closer to the end zone, so they weren't throwing a hail mary, mm -hmm. which you know chances are it's not going to work. So they figured if they could get closer to the end zone, then they could run an actual play that they have in the playbook. Makes sense to me. Make perfect sense. The problem was they didn't let the umpire touch the ball until they set it down to spike it. Then he had to come in, move guys out of the way, if you notice. Yeah, let's show that. He, Here's the umpire. Yeah, here, runs here it is. Look, look. Yeah. See, the umpire, well, that's when him setting the ball. But he had to get the guys out of the way so he could get to the ball. So mm -hmm. that's just time ticking off the clock. They know. These guys are supposed to know. At least the coach is supposed to tell them because the coach should know that the umpire has to touch the ball every single down before they could snap it at some point the umpire has to touch yeah. it Dak. and so they had to let the umpire get in and touch and the umpire went in there and had to move some guys out mm -hmm. of the way so he could touch the ball and then by the time he's now you look and that snap it 
Yeah, done. Dak, Dak game giving over. the ball to the center to set the ball was the was the mistake there because I think they would have still had maybe a second or two after Dak uh, after Dak spiked it, but could have also gone for two plays there. You're saying that you you like the play call at the end. I didn't mind it that much if they'd have been paying attention zone. to the clock and and they'd had a better shot of getting it to the end zone. But overall, I mean, when you let the Niners just run right down your throat to start the game and you got 14 penalty 14 mm -hmm. the first play of the game your guys offside like you can't see the ball right down there. look the ball's right, right there look the second half look, wait, look it's right there <laughs> you're, you're lined up right here the ball's right there and if I'm oh I'm a little too far I'm gonna Ooh, back up a half yes. step first series of the second what? half First series of the second what? half as well after they had gotten really kind of beat down pretty much in that first half there. So, again, I wrote here, starting game plan, bad. Dak, bad. Penalties, bad. Uh -huh. uh, fans later throwing things on the field, bad. bad. Uh, offensive That's line, That's another bad. thing. Yes. Oh, oh, now, this is, this is going to be controversial for a while. Or I'd be surprised if it's not. So, after the game, the Cowboys are leaving, the refs are leaving the field, and fans are throwing stuff. Now, Dak was asked about it after mm -hmm. the game, and I even have the uh, quote. So he thinks that the guys ask him about fans throwing stuff at the Cowboys. The Cowboys so play. Dak starts to ask, answer that question. He says, I didn't see that. It said da 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 But then the reporter says, I think they were aiming at the referees. And Dak says, credit to them then. Credit yeah. to them. Yeah, let's hear actually what Dak had to say here. Uh, is this, is yeah. this it? This is it right here. Yeah. When he's I think they were aiming at the referees. Yeah, yeah. they were referees. <laughs> Credit to them, then. That's yeah, a take. No, that's a take. That's a take. Yeah, they credit. weren't doing it to me. Oh, credit. Credit to them. I guess that's why the refs took off and got out of there so fast. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I think everybody's upset with the way that this, uh, this thing played out. Yeah, I'm okay. not sure you want to be uh, condoning <laughs> think, uh, fans throwing Dax, stuff at referees. Uh, yeah, Dak. I, I think just, Dak's wallet is about to get a little bit yeah, lighter I after that. Think, I, I could see a fine coming in. Yeah, well. I mean, I, I know they, they had problems with the referees yeah. in the Cardinal game, mm -hmm. and I know they, they thought there were some questionable calls yesterday. There were some calls that didn't get made. I mean, uh, Trayvon Diggs got hammered he did. That was on a, a blindside block, block, and, block. Yeah. and he didn't. there was no call. And then there was a couple holding calls that could have been called. I, I got it. I got it. I got it. But you can't be – I don't, just don't think that's a smart um, move condoning throwing stuff at the referees. So I do think Mike McCarthy anyway. sticks around. I, I think because they won the do division, you? they had right. a pretty good year. I'm interested to see what happens with the coordinators, David. <laughs> Obviously, uh, not, not feeling that, Mike McCarthy. Dak better spend every day in the offseason out <laughs> practicing. He needs to get he a quarterback bad. coach. Yeah. Some quarterback coach has got to come in and help this guy throw passes that lead receivers and throw passes to guys that aren't <laughs> surrounded by defenders three oh, around man. him. I mean, he threw some bad oh, balls boy. yesterday. He's got to – hey, real quick, let's, let's talk something positive. Real quick, can we end on this? We, we I'm sorry, Justin, here. I'm taking your time. The, <laughs> the Spurs signed Zach Collins. They got him up. He's going to the G League, so he's healthy. Oh, boy. Zach he's Collins. He's mm -hmm. like 6'11". Mm -hmm. He's 250 pounds. He's a young guy. He was a top. He was a top pick way back when by uh, by Sacramento. They traded to Portland. He played three years in Portland. Sat out last year with an injury. He's back. He's back. Well, that's all we have left, Spurs. David Sears, you were on fire this morning. Thank you. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. Take a take a sip of water. Yes. <laughs> We need to go straight to Justin Horn. <laughs> I'm worn out just watching it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go outside. We've got clear skies. Temperatures uh, right now 44 degrees. Dew point is at 21. Northwesterly winds at around 5 miles per hour. It, temperatures are already starting to jump into the 50s in several spots. We, we know it's going to be a warm afternoon. But this dry air, get those huge swings. Yes, we were down there freezing this morning, but we'll be right back up into the 70s uh, later today. 45 Gonzales, 43 New Braunfels, 55 Rock Springs, 46 in Carrizo Springs. Dew points are very very, very low in the 20s, even teens. So this is bone dry air. I will tell you this dew point will start to come up a little bit in the next couple days, but it's still very much chapstick weather. I mean, uh, your skin's dry this with this kind of dew point. So just uh, just a heads up forecast today. We're up around 70 sunny skies. Light winds should be a beautiful Martin Luther King Jr. Day. As we look across the country, now, there is some cold air, especially up and down the plains, up across the Great Lakes. That storm system came down the plains and then has uh, boomeranged up the east coast. And that has put down a lot of snow as far south as places like Atlanta, uh, Mississippi, North Carolina. And now it's starting to move up into New England and still producing some snow there. You can see it here on the satellite radar. Some pretty heavy snow, in fact, upstate New York, parts of Pennsylvania, and New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine seeing some snow. It's rain, though, for Boston. You can kind of see the cutoff there. New York pretty much just saw a cold rain as well. For us here in Texas, really good weather today. Not a cloud in the sky. We'll get some high clouds coming in tomorrow, but today I think it stays sunny. Here's a look at the future cast. 
and this is four o'clock this afternoon. Sunny skies tomorrow. A few high clouds. That's it should still be another really nice day. I'll be a little bit warmer. Wednesday is probably our warmest day out ahead of this cold front. But once this cold front moves through, boy, we're going to see some big changes. Gusty winds much, much cooler. Initially, I don't think we see much rain with the front, but it's behind it that there are a few concerns here because temperatures probably will get down to freezing, especially in the hill country by Thursday morning. That's that abrupt change. We also get a little bit of energy in here shows some light to uh, light precipitation here, probably a mix. Something to keep an eye on. I don't think it would have a huge impact, uh, but as we get into the afternoon, this model is showing just some cold uh, showers, a few very light showers here around San Antonio. Do have some models coming in that show temperatures trending a little bit colder. We'll see. I don't think again this is going to be a big issue, but it is something to watch as we get into Thursday. That'll be the day when we get that abrupt change. In the meantime, 70s next couple days 39 that's it that's what we're forecasting right now on thursday with some wind chills rebounding into the 40s and 50s by next weekend we'll be right back good news if you're looking for ways to make your home more energy efficient tomorrow in gmsa some simple things you can do to make it a little easier. Let's check on traffic. Of course, it is a federal holiday today. A lot of folks have a three day weekend. We're seeing quite a few cars out there in the normal busy spots, including Loop 410 at Callahan and Loop 410 at Starcrest. The loops uh, not quite as busy in that stretch. Busy at 281 and Hildebrand. Justin. We're already up into the 50s now, so 70 is a good bet this afternoon. Sunny skies will get a little bit more cloud cover tomorrow and then some abrupt changes. Wednesday night into Thursday, be prepared for some colder air headed our way. Well, the owner of Ben and Jerry's apparently wants to buy the brands, uh, the company that owns uh, brands like Aquafresh and Advil. Yeah, it's an interesting mix there. So Unilever is willing to pay big money for the company that makes products like Advil Tums and Aquafresh Fresh toothpaste as it tries to revive its sluggish stock and ramp up its focus on health products. GlaxoSmithKline said over the weekend it received unsolicited proposals from Unilever to acquire its consumer health care biz, which it runs as a joint venture with Pfizer. Latest price tag estimated at right around $70 billion, but Glaxo, GlaxoSmithKline said those prices or those proposals were too low. So Unilever, the company behind brands such as Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream and Dove Soap, has shown it's willing to ditch lower performing food and drink products uh, because its stock has remained kind of stagnant for the last couple of months. Matter of fact, last fall Unilever announced that it was selling its global tea business, which includes names like Lipton and Tazo to a private equity firm. What's weird here is we've got a British fund manager who said he thinks Unilever's biggest problem is they're focusing too much on sustainability and social justice issues. He wrote that the company is laboring under the weight of a management which is obsessed with publicly displaying sustainability credentials at the expense of focusing on the fund fundamentals of the business. I didn't know Unilever owned Ben and Jerry's. I thought that was like, you know, small business or not Same. small. These companies own tons of brands, yeah. both these companies. They own yeah. everything. There you Have go. Have a good day. Have a